Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this Bracia's Bite Size Employment Law Update. I just wanted to say thank you before I start to Diversity HR for partnering with us in delivering this webinar today. Um, I've included a slide here with their details if anybody would like to go over and have a look at their website. And as you can see on this slide, I will be your presenter today. Um, my name is Lisa Rothen. I am a senior associate in the employment team here at Bracia's and I will be delivering today's employment law update. We do have a fair amount of information to get through, so I'll do my best to get through it all in the time that we have. And you will also receive a copy of the slides at the end of the presentation. So don't worry about scribbling everything down. You will get a copy of those together with any relevant links that I mention and they'll come out to you afterwards. It may be a bit of a, a bit of a whistle stop tour of all of these bits and pieces but being an employment lawyer does mean there's constant change and 2024 is proving no different. Um, April of this year saw a number of employment law changes um, and I will be covering some of these today so it included the normal increases to national minimum wage and living wage and um, we've also got some other key legislative developments which really should be on an employer's radar and that's what I will be covering. So the first is the new increase in rates, we'll be looking at changes in flexible working, also the new carers leave regulations, new redundancy protections and I'm also going to have a look at a brief look at annual leave and holiday pay and if we get to it I've got some um, key case law updates tagged on at the end and um, if we don't get to them then you'll have the details on the slides that will come out to you. But I think on that basis, numbers are going up slightly, but I'm conscious of time. So I think let's get into it. So first topic we're looking at is the rates and limits. So typically, as many of you may be aware, the government, they review and increase their statutory payment rates each year. And we've seen those increases this year as well. There has been a slight change in how the national minimum wage and national living wage rates apply. So previously, the national minimum wage provided for the minimum hourly rate for workers above school age but under 23. That's the, the, the top level, kind of the 23 and over level has now been scrapped and from the 1st of April this year, so already in force, there's a new national living wage that applies to workers aged over 21 and above. So they've moved that, that age bracket down slightly. I've set out on the slide that you should hopefully see in front of you what the new rates were with effect from the 1st of April this year. We have seen some significant increases and I suspect that's to reflect the steep inflation levels that we're seeing and the ongoing cost of living increases that we're also all experiencing. We also saw an increase in the level of weekly statutory sick pay, so that's gone up from £109.40 per week to £116.00. 75. It's worth noting that if any employers offer enhanced or company sick pays, this could have a knock on effect on those schemes. So it's worth just reviewing and, and, and having a look at those. We've also seen increases in the rate of payments for a range of statutory leave entitlements. So the rate for statutory maternity and adoption pay after that initial six week period and also for paternity, shared parental and parental bereavement leave, that rate has increased from £172.48 to the new £184.03 per week or 90% of the employee's average weekly earnings if that is lower than the new statutory rate. Whilst I'm on the subject of family leave, I thought it would be worth noting and flagging to you all that there were also changes introduced as of the 6th of April to statutory paternity leave. So they were, these were introduced under the Paternity Leave Amendment Regulations 2024. And the changes that have come into force apply where the expected week of childbirth or the expected date of placement for adoption cases is after the 6th of April. So these changes apply for after the 6th of April. And one of the significant changes is that these regulations, sorry, these regulations have increased the period in which paternity leave can be taken. So it can now be taken at any time within 52 weeks following a childbirth or an adoption placement. 
It also allows for the two weeks to be separated out. They can be taken as blocks of one week at any point in that 52 week period, which I'm sure will be a welcome update from the previous rule, which required the two weeks to be taken together in the first eight weeks of birth. I'm sure for many parents that will be a useful change. There's also been some changes to the notice that's required to be given for paternity leave. So previously, an employee has to give 15 weeks notice to their employer before taking leave. That has now changed. So they're only required to give 28 days for each week of leave that they want to take. But it is worth noting they are still required to give 15 weeks notice of their intention to use this entitlement. So 15 weeks before birth, they should still give a notification but then only 28 days to take the week's leave itself. We've also seen some changes as of the 6th of April in the certain levels of compensation that are awarded where employment rights are breached. And one of the most common ones is a week's pay. So the cap on a week's pay is used for calculating both the basic award and non-fair dismissal claim and also in calculating statutory redundancy payments. That has now increased to £700. We've also seen an increase on the cap for the compensatory award also given in successful unfair dismissal claims and this has increased to £115,115. In terms of statutory redundancy payments, um, as many of you may be aware, that is calculated based on an employee's age, length of service and weekly pay. However, weekly pay is capped, as I've just mentioned. Length of service is also capped at 20 years, which provides for a maximum cap on the amount of statutory redundancy that somebody can receive. And that has also increased as of the 6th of April to £21,000. This is worth noting, this increase will um, be important if any employers have given notice of redundancy prior to the 6th of April, but the termination of employment doesn't take place until after the 6th of April, then the new rate will apply. So for example, if an employee is working their notice period. There's also been a change to the Vento ban. So these are the bans that are taken into account when calculating an award for injury to feelings. Um, they have been amended and I've set those out on the slide. So I won't take you through those in too much detail, but there is an additional. So we've got the upper band goes up to 58,700 pounds. And in the most exceptional cases, an award is capable of exceeding that limit. Our next topic then is flexible working. My, my colleagues, um, Catherine and Colin, they actually presented a, a detailed webinar on this only yesterday. Um, and I will include the link in my slides that come out to you so you can have a look at that. And that's another 30 minute or so webinar um, as it goes into slightly more detail in terms of the changes that have been introduced. But I will go over those with you today. So flexible working, ultimately it re refers to any kind of working arrangement that meets both an employer and an employee's needs in terms of when, where and how an employee works. I've included on the slide some examples of what that may look like. So for example, home working or hybrid working that we've seen far more of since COVID. It can also include staggered hours, compressed hours, etc. The Employment Relations Flexible Working Act was passed last July, but it came into force with effect of the 6th of April this year. Um, together with some amendments that were also passed together with the Act, there are a number of changes both to the right to make a flexible working request, but also the procedure to be followed. So the key changes are it has now become a day one right. Previously, employees had to have accrued 26 weeks continuous employment by the date that they made a request, and that is no longer required. They can make a, requ a request as of day one of their employment. The changes have also increased the number of inqu uh, requests apologies, that an employee can make. So that has been increased from one request to two requests in any 12 month period. They've also removed the requirement for employees to have to explain what effect their requested change may have on the employer and how that effect might be dealt with. There is no longer a, a requirement for an employee to include that when making a request. In terms of the changes for employers, Employers now only have two months, so that has been reduced from three months, to make a decision on the request subject to both the employer and employee agreeing a longer period. 
they are also not able to refuse a request unless they have a consulted with the employee and have explained the, re the reason for denying the request. ACAS have updated their code of practice on requests for flexible working, again with effect from the 6th of April, to reflect these new changes and also to provide support to employers and employees with the new scheme. But for employers, it is worth noting that whilst a failure to follow the code itself doesn't make a person or an organisation liable to proceedings, an employment tribunal will take the code into account when considering any relevant cases around flexible working requests. So it's something worth bearing in mind when you are considering requests under this formal procedure. In terms of making a statutory request for flexible working, an employee is still required to do so in writing and to state that they are making a request under the statutory scheme. The request should also include the date they're making the request, the change they're asking for, the date they would like that change to come into effect, and also whether or not they've made any previous requests for flexible working. Employers, it's worthwhile making clear to your employees that this is the information required to be, to, to be contained in a statutory request for flexible working. So, for example, you could include that in a flexible working policy if you have one in place. Once a statutory request has been received, as I mentioned, the employer, an employer now has a maximum of two months. That includes any time for an appeal to make a decision on the request unless the parties agree to extend that period. If the parties do agree to extend that period, then an employer must confirm that in writing to the employee. An employer should also handle the request in a reasonable way. And the Employment Rights Act sets out prescribed grounds on which an employer can refuse a request. I haven't set these out on the slides, but they include, for example, if to allow the request would have a detrimental impact on quality or performance or ability to meet customer demand or if it's a cost position um, or it would result in um, a need for a reorganisation of work amongst staff that just isn't possible um, or the need to recruit new staff to, to, to provide cover and that just isn't possible. But there are prescribed grounds um, on which a request can be refused and they should be referred to when considering a request. Unless an employer is looking to agree a request that's been submitted in full, they must now consult with the employee before making a decision. The idea of this is to enable an employer to gather all the relevant information they need to make a fully informed evidence-based decision on the request. And this meeting should be held without unreasonable delay, and it should be held on a date that is reasonable to both parties to enable them time to prepare. Um, it's also worth noting that an employee may request to be accompanied to such a, a consultation meeting. When making a decision, an employer must put this in writing and the, the notice should also confirm what has been agreed in terms of the request and the arrangements made. Um, it's also um, worthwhile the employee, sorry, the employer offering the employee the opportunity for a further discussion to refine any further details of the arrangement if that's necessary. If the request is being rejected, then that written decision to the employee should clearly explain the business reason and any other information that the employee has taken into account when reaching that decision. And again, it's worth noting that it can only be refused on those statutory prescribed grounds I've just mentioned. Whilst we've got this formal statutory scheme, it is also possible for employers and employees to reach informal flexible working arrangements. And that also applies to perhaps workers who don't have the right to make um, a formal flexible working request. A fle inflexible, sorry, not inflexible, informal arrangements can still be made between the parties. That, that's still a possibility. Carers leave. So this is a new type of leave that came into force under the Carers Act 2023 on the 6th of April. This introduces a, another day one right. So it's a day one right for employees who have a dependent with a long term care need to take up to one week's leave in order to provide or arrange care. We do have a definition of dependent. So dependent for the purposes of this leave is a spouse or partner, parent or child. It also includes anybody living in the employee's household, albeit not as a tenant or a lodger. 
And it also includes anyone who reasonably relies on the employee to arrange their care, so not necessarily a relative. We've also got a definition of long-term care needs. So a dependent will be considered to have a long-term care need for the purposes of this leave if they have an illness that is likely to require care for more than three months, if they have a disability as per the definition provided under the Equality Act, Equality Act 2010, or if they require care for a reason connected to old age. The meaning of care, perhaps unhelpfully, isn't defined, but it is likely to include things such as taking dependents to medical appointments, for example. It's also worth noting that if an individual is not classed as a dependent on the employee or they do not have a long term care need, the right to this type of leave doesn't apply to the employee, but they may have a right to reasonable time off a dependent subject to meeting the relevant criteria for that type of leave. Employees that would like to utilise their right to take carers leave can take up to one week off in each 12 month period and a week means the length of time that that employee would normally work within seven days. The leave itself doesn't have to be taken in a block of one week, it can be taken as a half day or full days up to one week and it also doesn't need to be taken on consecutive days, it can be taken to suit an individual's caring responsibilities. But if an employee does want to take Carers leave, they are required to give notice, so they must give at least three days notice if they're requiring leave of one day, up to one day, so half a day or one day, or they are required to give at least twice as many days as the requested leave period if they require two or more consecutive days. So, for example, if they want to take two days leave, they will need to give four days notice. An employee isn't required to provide evidence to support their request for carer's leave, but they are required to confirm that they have an entitlement to this type of leave under the regulations when making their request. It may be worthwhile for employees to consider, therefore, if they want some kind of official request form in which an employee is required to tick a box certifying their entitlement, and this may well assist in discouraging anybody that may be thinking of using this type of leave when perhaps they're not entitled to do so. Alternatively, it may be worth introducing a carer's policy um, and together the form can be attached to that. An employer can't decline a request for carer's leave altogether. They may be able to postpone the leave where they consider reasonably that it would unduly disrupt business operations. But there are strict timeframes and procedures around postponing carer's leave. And furthermore, an employer is then required to allow the employee to take the leave that has been requested at a, mutu a mutually convenient time, but within one month. So there is still a requirement to allow the leave, but it may be that it can be postponed. Any carer's leave taken is unpaid, but all other terms and conditions of employment applicable to the employee would apply during any period of carer's leave. Employers should be aware, perhaps unsurprisingly, that where an employee takes a period of carer's leave or seeks to take a, a period of carer's leave and are subsequently dismissed or subjected to any detriment as a result, they are protected from such conduct. And if, for example, they are dismissed for taking such leave, that will be considered automatically unfair. A look ahead slightly in terms of the other types of leave we are likely to see in the future. Um, the Neonatal Care Leave and Pay Act was passed also last year, but isn't expected to come into force until around April next year. And on its introduction, this act will provide an entitlement to 12 weeks paid leave, so that is paid leave, for parents of babies that need neonatal care. So that's babies that are admitted to hospital up to the age of 28 days and are then in hospital for seven full days or more. As I said, this will be accompanied by the right to pay, so they will be entitled to pay for this leave, and it's expected that it will mirror the statutory prescribed rates or 90% of the employee's average weekly earnings, if, if that is lower, which is similar, for example, to maternity pay. Now looking at redundancy protection, so these have been extended this year, 
um, for pregnant employees and also those that are returning from a period of family leave. So the Protection from Redundancy Pregnancy and Family Leave Act was passed also last year um, and has introduced this additional redundancy protection with effect from the 6th of April. So again, this one is already in force. Previously, during a redundancy process, an employer was obliged to offer anybody on maternity leave, adoption leave or shared parental leave, suitable alternative employment, if it existed, as a priority over any other employees who were also provisionally selected for redundancy and a failure to do so would be automatically unfair. Well, the Act that I've referred to above and the regulations noted on the slide have now extended the entitlement to be offered a suitable alternative to introduce protection during pregnancy. So that will include the date that an employer is notified that an employee is pregnant up to the day that their statutory maternity leave starts or where an employee isn't entitled to statutory maternity leave, it will go up to two weeks after their pregnancy comes to an end. And it also extends the period. So when, where an employee has, that has been on relevant family leave returns to work, we've now got an additional protected period of up to 18 months after the date of the birth of their child or an adoption placement in which they are protected and should be offered a suitable alternative in a redundancy situation if such a position exists. I've set out on this slide the relevant protected periods, so depending on the type of leave or whether or not it's pregnancy um, that applies to an employee, I've then set out the, the additional or extended protected periods for them. Where the protected period covers pregnancy, the new rules apply where the employee notifies the employer of the pregnancy on or after the 6th of April. Where it relates to a period after an, uh, an employee has taken relevant leave, then the new rules apply to any maternity or adoption leave ending on or after the 6th of April. So that's just worth noting moving forward. We now move on to annual leave. So last year, the government announced a major update to the law on holidays, um, all of which have been implemented this year and, and ongoing. And these have been implemented through the Employment Rights Amendment, Revocation and Transitional Provis Provision Regulations 2023. Bit of a mouthful. Um, there are a number of key changes to this area of law that employers really do need to be aware of. Um, it's a significantly detailed area of change, so I am only intending to provide an overview today. But again, um, colleagues of mine presented a very useful webinar on the topic last month, and I will include the link to that on the slides that come out to you. So if you want to um, have a look at a more detailed review, then you've got that available to you. Ultimately, the retained EU law, Revocation and Reform Act of 2023, it abolished certain EU laws relating to working time regulations. And as a result, the government drafted new regulations in order to fill in the gaps that the repeal of that relevant law left. And the employment rights regulations that I referred to, they now cover holiday pay, tupi and working time. Um, in terms of calculating a week's pay, there are... Um, new rules reflected in the regulation, but which really mirror what employees should have, employers, sorry, should have already been doing in terms of calculation in practice. It just means we've now got these rules set in stone. The regulations also set out a new system of holiday accrual and payment for that holiday for workers class as irregular hours and part year workers. And the government has published some guidance on these new holiday provisions, which I would suggest you have a look at. They can be found on the government website. They do include some useful examples. And um, there's also some other bits and pieces that are perhaps of less value, but it is worth giving them a read. So in terms of when these changes take effect, the new provisions around how much you need to pay employees when they're on holiday and carry forward of any leave, they came into force on the 1st of January this year, so they are already in force. The changes that apply to part year and irregular hours workers, it's slightly more complicated in that they come into force in the employer's leave year, which starts on or after the 1st of April 2024. 
So what does this mean? So if you have a leave year that runs from the 1st of April to the 31st of March, then these new rules already apply to you. If you have a leave year that mirrors the calendar year, so the 1st of January to the 31st of December, the new rules will apply from the 1st of January 2025, so next year. And then the latest date they could apply is for any employees that have a leave year running from the 31st of March in one year to the 30th of March in the following year. The new rules will apply from the 30th of March next year. So what do the regulations say? Regulation 13 now provides for the four weeks leave that we are entitled to that was originally derived from the working time directive. And the regulations also define what amounts to a week's pay for paying employees for both this type of holiday, so this four weeks holiday, and also in terms of any rolled up holiday pay under the new regulation 15B, which I will come on to in a moment. But ultimately, employees should receive what they would normally receive had they been at work. The regulations therefore provide that in addition to salary, when a worker goes on holiday, they should also receive payments that are intrinsically linked to the performance of the task to which the worker is obliged to carry out under their contract. So this would include, for example, payments for commission or overtime. They should also include, as I've noted on the last two bullet points on the slide, payments for any professional or personal status relating to length of service, seniority or qualifications, and also payments which have been regularly paid to the worker in the 52 weeks preceding the calculation date. So it's important that employees review whether or not they are including these additional sums within their holiday pay calculations. The chief impact really is going to be for those workers who receive a basic salary, but with additional elements such as commission and overtime, as these will now need to be included when calculating the average weekly amount to be paid to them. And the average weekly is calculated over a 52 week period. This method of calculation doesn't apply to the additional 1.6 weeks domestic leave that we get that is now reflected in these regulations under 13a and and ultimately it mirrors the eight days bank holidays we we get in the uk and for that holiday an employee is entitled to receive their basic pay for that period only um, employers may choose to pay the two different types of holiday in different ways however most employers take a joined up approach and they pay for both types of holiday in the same way The regulations also in, sorry, also introduced then a new holiday accrual system for those irregular and part year workers that I've mentioned. Irregular hours workers and part year workers are defined in the regulations, so I'm not going to take you through those at the moment. They are quite wordy. But ultimately, for these workers, for their leave year starting on or after the 1st of April, their holiday entitlement will no longer be governed in accordance with our normal 5.6 weeks entitlement. It will derive from the new regulation 15B. So this is the system that you should be working to calculate holiday for irregular hours and part year workers. Notably, the new entitlement is, a, is calculated in hours and not weeks. So we've previously had the 5.6 weeks for these workers. It will now be in hours. And for these workers, their holiday will accrue at a rate of 12.07% of the hours they actually work during a relevant pay period. So whether that's a month or a week, but the entitlement is still capped at 28 days. Notably, this holiday accrues in arrears rather than in advance. So an employee will work their relevant pay period. A calculation is then done in terms of the holiday that they've accrued. This may well cause some difficulties in practice as we get to the end of a holiday year. So let's say your holiday year ends in March, end of March, you get to the end of March and employees informed of what holiday they've accrued, but they've now haven't got any time to take it. So in practice, there could be some difficulties. I suspect what will happen is that that perhaps can be um, taken in the following year, but that is yet to be seen. In terms of pay for this type of holiday, it's slightly different because an employer does have an option to choose between two systems for paying for this type of holiday. They can either pay using the traditional weeks pay method that I've just mentioned, or they can pay using a newly introduced rolled up holiday pay, which is introduced under regulation 16A. 
And what this provides is where an employer elects to pay for this type of holiday via rolled up holiday pay, they are required to um, provide an uplift or apply an uplift also of 12.07% to a worker's remuneration for the work done in each pay period. So if they work a month, the calculation would be done on, on how much work has been done, how much they're entitled in terms of payments, and then there should be a 12.07% uplift on that. It's important to note that if an employer elects to use this method of paying a holiday, it must be separately itemised on pay slips. Pay slips shouldn't just reflect one amount of money, it should separately reflect the rolled up holiday pay. And that's really important if any difficulties arise further down the line in terms of an employee raising concerns perhaps that they haven't been paid. It's also important to note that whilst holiday pay is rolled up and paid in each relevant pay period, workers should still be allowed to take their holiday entitlement. Just because they've been paid for it doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to take it. What it does mean is when they do take it, they're not entitled to any other payments because they would have already been paid for their holiday. In terms of carryover of leave, the general rule is that statutory holiday could only be taken in the leave year that that it accrued on a, on a use it or lose it basis. And there were some exceptions that have derived from case law, but what the new changes have done have, have now enshrined the position in statute. So there is now a statutory right for a worker to carry over leave if they've been able, unable to take it due to um, any kind of period of statutory leave. So for example, maternity, paternity, shared parental leave. If they've been unable to take it due to a period of sick leave, or where an employer has failed, and that's the abbreviation, and ultimately it's where an employer has failed to either recognise a worker's right to take leave or to take paid leave, or where they have failed to give the worker a reasonable opportunity to take that leave or, or have encouraged them to do so, or where they have been failed to inform the worker that if they don't use their leave by the end of the leave year, it cannot be carried forward and will be lost. I think some of these carry carryover provisions are probably already being practiced by employers, but that last one, I suspect, by not so many. I think this is the fact that this is now included in statute is something that employers really need to take note of. Um, in terms of the periods for which leave can be carried over, it's slightly complicated in terms of it will depend on the type of leave being referred to and the reason that the worker has not been able to take it. And, I, and I've set it out, or attempted to set it out in a, in a table on the slide just to make it simpler. I've separated out here at the top. So regulation 13 now, provides for the four weeks annual leave. 13A now provides for the 1.6 weeks leave, that's our total 5.6 weeks. And 15B now refers to the rolled up holiday pay that I've just mentioned. So hopefully that table will help in explaining what the duration of any carryover is. I think the important take homes for employers regarding these changes is that you really need to familiarise yourself with these new rules and ensure that your practices and policies are updated to be in line with them. Um, it's really important as well to identify, do you have any regular hours workers or part year workers? Do these, do, do these new rules apply to them? And if they do, you need to make a decision on how you're going to pay for this type of holiday. If you are going to use the rolled up holiday approach, then it's important that this is consistent with that 12.07% um, calculation um, and that this uplift is provided to include also any additional payments such as overtime commission, the professional payments, and it's not just basic pay. You'll also need to ensure really that workplace arrangements are ready to administer these new systems of accrual and pay. How is that going to work via payroll at the end of each week, month when payments should be made? It's also worth reviewing your workers' contracts and also any holiday policies, because whilst these changes have been introduced, what you'll need to consider is, well, actually, are you able to make them under your employee's contract or does your employee's contract provide for a different type of calculation i.e they now have a contractual right to one type of calculation and a legal right to this type of calculation so we want to ensure that they are reviewed as well 
And in terms of that kind of carryover where employers have failed to um, keep employees up to date on their holiday entitlement, the kind of use it or lose it, um, it'd be a really good idea, um, I think, for employers to send notices to workers on an annual basis. So remind them that they need to take their leave, perhaps how much leave that they have outstanding um, and informing them that if they don't take it, they will lose it at the end of the year. And perhaps as you approach the end of a leave year, sending out specific notices to those workers that have still got quite a lot of holiday left on the clock, again, reminding them that they do need to take that leave because if they don't, they will lose it. Okay. As mentioned, I have included a couple of kind of key case law updates on the slide. I'm conscious of time. So I'm not going to take you through this because I do have a couple of questions. So rather than take you through the detail of these cases, as I said, details are included on the slides that you will get. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. Let me just drag them over. That I'll see. Oh, apologies, I'm having a technical glitch. We can address before the end. So somebody has asked, is carers leave paid or unpaid? So carers leave, it's an unpaid entitlement, but all other kind of T's and C's of employment would apply during that period of leave. And somebody's has asked, again, in, in relation to carer's leave, what happens if an employer wants to postpone the leave? However, the leave is for an appointment that can't be rescheduled. So as I mentioned, if we, I just take you back to the slide. There's no outright entitlement for an employer to refuse the leave. They can only postpone it and they can only postpone it if they reasonably consider it would unduly disrupt business operations. If they are able to show that reasonably, that's the impact allowing the leave would have, then they would be entitled to postpone it. There are other rules and regulations and procedures and timeframes around that. So it's worth having a look at it, but that's the test that they would need to be able to fulfill in order to be able to postpone that, that carer's leave request. Okay, that's all the questions that I've had. I know we're now at 140, so I will bring the webinar to an end. As I said, thank you again all for joining today. Thank you for joining again today. You'll get the slides. Um, I, I suspect you'll also get a feedback form. Um, so particularly if you found today's webinar useful, it's always nice to get some good feedback. Um, but also if there's any other topics that you would like us to um, consider in the future or cover off in the future, um, then also pop that in the, the feedback form. It's also, it, it's always useful for us when tailoring webinars going forward. Um, and I've also, hopefully you can still see up on the screen um, our social media link. So give us a follow. As I said, there are a, a couple of really useful useful webinars done previously on some of the topics that I've flown through today. So it's always worth having a, having a look through those. But thank you again for joining and I will see you all soon.